fragments. What are they good for? How many of you are already familiar with fragments? Show of hands. Okay, good crowd. Now, how many of you are brand new to fragments? You have never used them or kind of somewhat unfamiliar with them? Okay, well, full disclosure, this is more like kind of a beginner talk or a refresher for those who are, are experienced with fragments. So let's get started. Fragments are a powerful yet controversial part of Android development. They provide almost as many benefits as they do issues. They are the tabs versus spaces of our development world. Today, get to know why fragments are used, the, the different types which they come in, including the leading to the anatomy and the life, infamous life cycle. We'll take that one step further into how to use them in basic activity, along with the common usage, three primary ways, concluding with best practices. Fragments were introduced all the way back in Android Honeycomb to help alleviate the new screen sizes that were, that had just been introduced thanks to the introduction of tablets. They help us reuse components into into multiple activities, provide much the same functionality, yet even do a few things better. That's not to say activities themselves are deprecated. They still have a role within their ecosystem, acting more like a container view than anything else. They, each activity allow, then each activity, you define certain parts in order to actually use fragments. However, there are two main types of fragments. Static and dynamic. Static fragments, not seen here, are placed within an activity's layout and never changed out. This is okay, yet doesn't really give the true functionality they have. That is where dynamic fragments come into play. Dynamic fragments are almost like reconfigurable puzzle pieces. They have their own life cycle, their own anatomy, their own classes, and even subtypes. With the addition of their own layout, almost like activity in many respects. In order to use a dynamic fragment, simply requires the usage of a container to place that fragment in. This is normally a frame layout within a standard activity. However, there are all types of other layout variations, which we'll get to see a little bit later. Each of these containers requires an ID. And no matter which type of fragment you're using, there are two main types, subtypes within fragments themselves, dynamic fragments themselves, framework and support. Framework fragments have been around since fragments inception some five years ago. They're rarely updated, which is why, and do not work with app compactivity, the current version of activities, which are where support fragments come into play. Support fragments come from the version four support library and do work with app compact activities. They have, they're constantly updated alongside the support library, usually three or four times per year, as you might expect. They, within, just as Android is constantly updated, there are new features added to fragments, such as child fragments. Through the power of this library, the older versions of Android, which would not otherwise support these features, do receive them. We can see this in such examples as with child fragments, aka fragments nested inside fragments. Within each of these, through the, through the support library, when this feature was introduced in Android Jelly Bean 2, the older versions of Android, which may not have otherwise been able to support this great new feature, instantly received it. For these reasons and many more, such as supporting older versions of Android, such as Donut, if you're so masochistically inclined, are, all, are, are part of reasons why you almost always use the support library version of fragments, 
at this point in time. Each fragment itself has an infamous life cycle, which lives on top of activity's life cycle. This is complex for even the most of experience of Android developers. And is controlled by the managing activity. Yet, with a few exceptions, most of these lifecycle methods have an activity equivalent, which is where we'll spend the bulk of our focus for the rest of this presentation. The first of those lifecycle methods is on attach. Unattach is called by the managing activity when a fragment is first attached, yet it's not really interactable. There's rarely, there's not much that is done here. However, something is still worth to know, as we see an example here. Unattach is where you can actually begin to start using the context. However, it's not advised, as it may be null. And for any fragment's context with an activity to interact with it is a get activity. Beyond on attach, on create is called as you might expect, with a lot of the same setup as you probably saw from Chris and Marciano's talk, Chris and Mars talk, which is then followed by on create view. On create view is where you set up your user interface, so your layout, your views, and can set a certain boolean to ensure whether a fragment is recreated from here or not. That should always be set to false. And instead of trying to look at this mess of code right here, we'll take a closer look at these different parts which you replace. The first is you generally take a view, normally call a root view, and pass in the flayer to inflate the layout with parameters such as the actual fragment's layout, a view collection, view, view container collection, which just takes in, all, takes in all the views and kind of manages them, along with that bundle which will recreate the fragment, which you must set to false. Beyond the uncreated view, activity created, where a lot of heavy lifting occurs. This is called in conjunction with activity's on create method, so that anything that you may want to do within, you know, you do within activity's on create method, you would do here. After on activity created, there are still, there are a few standard lifecycle methods similar to that of activity such as on start, on resume, and on pause, which behave as such. In the process as a fragment is being broken down, on destroy view is called. On destroy view is where you clean up anything that goes on with your, your views to ensure that system resources themselves are saved. So anything, so anything such as like button clicks or text listeners or checkbox listeners, you would want to make sure that you unregister them here. After on destroy view, on destroy, and finally on detach are called. On detach is the last lifecycle method before a fragment is fully detached from an activity. It, at this point, the fragment is no longer available whatsoever and any type of calls to get to that parent activity's context through get activity will return null and cause that infamous null pointer exception. One additional part of the setup for a fragment is creating a new instance method. A new instance method allows the creation of a fragment kind of like a constructor in a hybrid of unsafe instance state. It's where, you save, it's where you set some default data in order to use, such as like titles, strings, various integers, various, various pieces of primitive data which you would want to make sure is always there. 
They help you set, they, in order to use a new instance, you must always, you must always create a empty constructor as that's part of what goes into creating a fragment. Kind of like an activity in some sense. New instance takes a bundle and uses key value pairs to set and later get these various pieces of data in your on create view method. As we see here, it's very simple as core. You could pass in your integer, strings, part of the, the required parameters, customizing it for your various needs. Once you set up all these various methods, get to really start playing on, get to know how to use fragments. This is done with an activity through a fragment manager. A fragment manager is this all-encompassing method which helps manage fragments, pulling them in and out, removing them, adding them, removing them, replacing them, and even help restoring them. They manage a list of fragments with activity, holding a list, and help perform transactions, which are the series of actions we'll get to shortly. It calls our chain using a fluid interface, which keeps you from, rec from creating unnecessary multiple fragment managers to do so. Each type of fragment manager has a equivalent within, with the type of fragment you use. So if you use a, if you, for some reason are using framework fragments, it would be get fragment manager. In the case of support fragments, it's get support fragment manager. A fragment manager must know how to identify which fragment it's using, which is done through one of two ways, either fragment ID or fragment tag. These work much like Find view by ID to help determine which fragment itself is to pull in for transactions. Find fragment by ID takes in the container layout's ID, unlike what you may expect, like the fragment's ID. The find fragment by tag, on the other hand, takes in a string constant to determine which fragment is used, kind of like the tag you use in debugging. Once you set up this specific type of ID identification way to use for your fragment is when you can start working with transactions. Transactions are the series of actions which bring your fragment in, out, or replacing them. They always have a start off with a begin transaction method called by the fragment manager, which states that fragment transaction is about to occur. They are usually followed by a series of actions, either add, replace, or variety of others. There can be multiple actions as part of a transaction. And they are always concluded with a commit to ensure that every action has been committed. As we see here, this is a, in this basic add example called begin transaction through our fragment manager, calling the add method with the fragment with the activity ID, activities lay, layout container ID, and the fragment itself, specific fragment itself, which could be the new instance here. In the values fragment tag, you would place fragment tag as a third parameter. As always, a commit is called to tie all these things together. Now with all this basic setup is what you can now unleash the power of fragments through three primary ways. First of those are tablets, which will then cover the tab layouts, which are unlike tablets yet can be used with them. This will make more sense in a minute. <laughs> and including with dialogue fragments. Tablets 
tablets have all this extra real estate space you want to work with. They are where you can bring in multiple fragments at a single time. Through, the, through all this, you would, it would be foolish not, to, ha not to, to just have one single fragment on a screen at a time. We can see this in a common design pattern called master detail flow, such as in email apps, where you have a list of items normally on a phone, at, where within a phone you have a single list of items which would, with very basic information, and then details on the next screen. However, in tablets, you want these to be side by side in order to maximize the usage of your real estate. Extending your application to use, fragment, to use all the extra real estate requires just a little bit of extra work. Generally set up a layout with a specific resource qualifier, which we'll get to in a minute, and a condition to determine which type of device you're on. Taking a, deep, a quick run through into what a resource qualifier is, it helps you change the configuration of your app based upon certain conditions, such as language, day or night mode, and even screen width or height. For tablets, this is done through a, a screen width qual resource qualifier, which sets an absolute minimum width a screen must be for a certain condition to be true. It is generally considered best practice to set up like a Boolean with, with a default value and no resource qualifier whatsoever so with a name such as is tablet to false and then add a resource qualifier with a value of, with a, resource, with a screen width of 600. This will set the absolute minimum width a screen must be for such condition to be true and to ensure that you use a correct layout for your application. Pulling that into your activity is it's pretty simple. Just you can then go through and create a private boolean with a similar name to help keep confusion down. Checking getting the resource and then checking it within your, through an if-else condition within your application. And there you have it, the first way in which fragments are commonly used to help you in your day-to-day -day life as an Android developer. The second area is with tab layouts. How many of you are familiar with tab layouts as an Android user? They're quite common and they're very powerful. They allow you to easily switch between various screens, each of which are generally united to each other, such as a Mi app with like music, movies, and TV. Each one of these various screens is a fragment. Tab layout makes switching easy and efficient. However, it, is, it cannot do its work alone. For that, they come from the design support library, which you must manually import to your application. There are several different forms that come in, such as fixed tabs or sliding tabs. Personally, fixed tabs are a better user experience pattern because sliding tabs can, can otherwise get lost within phones. Tab layouts are just one part of the piece in terms of how to use this design pattern. And that, which, next, which works alongside a view pager. A view pager allows you to easily and quickly swipe between these various tabs without ever touching the titles or the icons, wherever that they may be. They come from the version 4 support library and are set, and are set in an activities layout along with a tab layout too so that they can be used kind of like a view or recycler view in some sense. However, that's still not all what it takes to use this design pattern. 
And that is where pager adapters come into play. A pager adapter manipulates pages to actually use, such as the fragments themselves, so that the view pager and the tab layout know which fragment a user is on at a given time. They come in, they can be set in their own class or within an anonymous inner class, kind of like an on-click listener for buttons. They come in two main types, which are quite similar, yet slightly different. Fragment pager adapter and fragment state pager adapter. Both of these have a get count method, which terms number of fragments that, which will be shown is simply an integer, a get item method, which takes the position of each fragment, where you place a new instance of each fragment, manage, and they're managed through a fragment manager as part of their constructor. However, that's where the differences, that's where the similarities end, as fragment pager adapter keeps all pages in memory at a single time and never fully remove them. This can be problematic for any type of application which is memory intensive. That is where our pal, the fragment state pager adapter, comes into play. It manages only the single page a user is on at a time and will all fully remove the fragment so that it does not take up unnecessary memory, later recreating it through new instance or save instance state. For anything that's even remotely intensive, fragment state pager adapter is the route you should go. Beyond that, it takes just a little bit of setup to use this great design pattern. Saying your view pager and your tab layout, kind of like views in your activity, passing in a, a state pager adapter or whichever type of pager adapter you're using, then, path, then calling the tab layout set with view pager to, actually, to connect the, view, the tab layout to the view pager allows you to use this great part, this great user interface design pattern. The third and final area which we'll cover into some depth today are dialogue fragments. Dialogue fragments work along with alert dialogues. They help, however, they do have a couple of differences. They easily restore the state of a or dialogue, so in the event the event a device is rotated, it does not disappear. They have their own on create view method, which allows you to set customize your alert dialogue, along with alert on create dialogue method, where you create alert dialogue to use. As we see here, it's not much set up outside of the alert dialog, which you're likely familiar with from your, any type of Android development, which you may have already done. Setting up a dialog fragment is relatively simple with a few key differences as compared to working with a Sayer fragment. Beyond using your fragment manager and creating an instance of alert dialog of a dialog fragment, you must use a show method of the dialog fragment to actually show the alert dialog. This takes in the fragment manager and a fragment tag and were to show. And there you have it, the third area where fragments are most commonly used. There are a few odds and ends which did which you don't get to cover today in detail, however, they're worth mentioning. A navigation jar, those are navigation jar, child fragments, and headless fragments. The navigation jar is part of the infamous hamburger menu, which allows a, which partially obscures your, acti your activity or fragment to reveal a way of to nav quickly navigate between various other screens. Child fragments, as noted earlier, are fragments nested inside of other fragments. 
they have their own unique version of the fragment manager and are and it can be quite difficult for beginners to use. Finally, headless fragments, which are fragments without user interface. They're used to perform long-running operations in the background and do a lot of the same functionality as such as a service or other background tech threads. Personally, we recommend you not to ever use headless fragments, otherwise end up like a Kabod crane. Closing, there are a few best practices to follow. For any single activity, keep a maximum of three fragments. This will help you keep the management of transactions down and save many headaches later on. For fragments and tab layouts, five fragments max is, pre is a good pattern to follow as otherwise your user interface becomes cluttered. For any type of interaction between activity and fragment, create an interface within your fragment for the activity override. This is especially useful for button clicks as a frag which would bring another fragment on the screen as fragments themselves should know, or know about each other since they are recomposable components and could be in any given activity at a time. If you do use fragments, create them early. Try to break down the multiple activities as fragments is a torture not even he would recommend. And there you have it, fragments. What are they good for? They are, they're good for a lot. They're, they have their own unique life cycle, they have their main types, they have various complications, and they even have some great things they do very well. I hope through today that you've decided that if you're not using fragments already, or have some hangups about them, that you will reconsider your decision to avoid fragments. However, with all great things, there, is, there can be too much, such as using a fragment for every single activity, that's a little over. Kill. Which is why, as we learn from our our, our, our <laughs> we learn from our pal Pierre Parker's uncle. Thank you. My name is David Hope. I am at Hope Developer on Twitter, and I'm the lead Android engineer for Street Stop. Do you have any questions? <laughs> yeah. Well, fragment. Okay. So you're asking why, personally, you don't like headless fragments. Hellas fragments, I just don't think that it really does offer as much benefit as they could through, through saving state. I think it's just better to go that way and use something like a dedicated service or other option. So headless fragments, so she's asking what headless fragment is. A little bit more detail. Headless fragments are a fragment without a user interface, so they do perform like long running operations in the background. And they can be retained, which is itself kind of an issue in fragments. Okay, so I was asking why, what to say to people who believe that views should be used for everything and that fragments really could be replaced by views. Well, custom views still have their own place in this world. Like if you try and replace an entire screen with custom, view, with custom views, it's better off to use a fragment as, it, as you're just recreating a lot of the same stuff. However, with, if you're just creating like a custom part of the screen, like, such as like a cipher view, use custom views or other options. So what are the best practices for navigation between fragments? Yeah, okay, so in one case, I didn't cover this, is like there's an add to back stack method, which helps you, which you can pass in null as a value. It's better to pass in a unique tag to bring it back so you can tell where, to, where it is later on. Otherwise, null just becomes problematic. Okay, thank you.